which has started around 1999 to 2000, where Hugo Chavez took over. Uh, and so even though he promised that, and he was democratically elected, uh, and he promised that he would bring a reform and growth to the economy, but instead uh, took it over and used socialism to make things such as toilet paper and fruits, things that they could easily make, almost impossible to find because the government didn't know that they needed toilet paper or fruits. Um, and so since then, in his passing of 2013, uh, his vice president uh, then took over. And since then, uh, we've seen Venezuela go into an economic collapse uh, because socialism just didn't work out for it. So, you can, and uh, <coughs> Venezuela also has like a 1 million percent inflation rate. And they used to be the richest country in South America, but now they're starving because, like Ken said, they can't find fruit and stuff like that. Why were they the richest country in South America? Because of all the oil and oh. natural resources. Their economy was built around the oil, and okay. one of the things that led to their collapse was they had put all their eggs in one basket, and then or all their gas in one tank, basically. <laughs> yes. um, and then when the oil prices dropped pretty significantly, their economy collapsed, and that was obviously prices good. dropped, so revenue dropped, so their in their GDP went down. Yes. Okay. And that was affected because Hugo Chavez died. Is that what I heard earlier? Really no. Yeah, well, so Hugo Chavez did die. Yes. Uh, but when his vice president took over, it was then after that point where the oil prices dropped, and so then because of his policies, it then sent the country into an economic climate. I mean, that sounds terrible. We don't want that to the United States. So, um, but are there any examples of uh, socialist government-run countries that have done really well? Uh, using socialism? <clears throat> so the only one that we could find was Catalonia is, has arguably been seen as a country that had a socialist success in the sense that it was working up until the point that they got invaded and a revolution uh, occurred. Um, and so some, some people would argue that it was working and it was only because of the revolution that that happened and some people would argue that the revolution came because socialism was taking over. Um, and so it really comes down to a point of view thing where you can then argue that that was working um, and it was because of outside forces or you could argue that because of socialism working, something rose from the inside. Um, and another one that was often seen as, uh, as good until it wasn't was Venezuela, which is often seen as something that was great and great and great and great until eventually all the after effects happened and it caught up with itself and so while it was functioning it was like a symbol of socialist success until eventually it fell apart. Uh, am I the only one who doesn't know where Catalonia is? It's like Spain. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think uh, it sounds so, like so I guess the other question that I have is most likely because of the way the United States is set up we're not going to have a purely socialist form of government. Probably not going to happen. Um, more likely, some of those socialist practices might be incorporated into democratic socialism. Is maybe more the way that people are living. Um, are countries that are practicing that is that successful for them? Are there there are <coughs> things happening in that those countries because of those practices? So Denmark is often seen as a country that is a, a socialist success, even though the prime minister would say otherwise that they are a free market nation. And so often they're seen as a hybrid between the two. Um, the big thing with Denmark is that they have uh, free health care, they have uh, free schooling. The way that they've set up their economy is very, very socialist in that they're giving out benefits to a large population of their people. But the only way that they can, that they can support that is through the free market. And so they have a 50% tax on income and luxuries, which is higher than, than here in America, of course. And so it makes it half. Yeah, it is. And so you get things like cars that are exorbitantly high prices, um, stuff that we're seeing as $118,000 to $120,000 for even your lowest level car, things that we would see as insane, they have, uh, because of their benefits with health care, we're seeing with it's not necessarily working out. Um, and so Denmark has recently been you know, allowing for private institutions to take over in terms of health care and schooling which then in turn make the government look like it's not doing as well because private schooling isn't run down or deteriorated. Private health care is quick and easy and affordable and a choice as well. So, yeah. And um, 
Also, there's something called the index of economic freedom that kind of compares what we're talking about right now, like how many regulations are in a, com in a country. And Denmark scores pretty closely to America. So it's obviously not a socialist com country by any means. But it does have socialist policies, but ultimately it is, at, like at the end of the day, it's a free market country with socialist policies, some socialist policies. Did you guys buy a car that had a 50% markup on it to get back to the government? No, no, no. I wonder if there's less part of the deal. Yeah. What's that? Sorry. My health care was free. The health care was free. It's a trade-off, right? I'll pay more for my car and my free health care. Um, right, you mentioned France, Germany, and, and the UK, right, are have socialist, I think you said socialist practices, but aren't a socialist country. Yes. So, right, can you tell me a little bit more about them and the way their governments are run? Uh, it's a lot like Denmark is, uh, yeah. just in the sense that they're going to, be going to provide more benefits that we would pay for privately, and uh, they'll do it through the government and through government practices. And so stuff like health care is the big one that's been in the news recently, just because uh, countries are adopting more and more free health care by doing through the government and increases in taxing, uh, along with we're seeing stuff as in school reforms, along with other various benefits, but health care is the big one. So one of my favorite quotes from Mr. Sisk, uh, who was quoting somebody else when he says it, is somebody's got to pay, right? Yeah, and that problem with socialism is we eventually run out of other people's money. <laughs> Margaret, Margaret Thatcher, the Iron Lady, said that. You run out of other people's money. So um, at what point in these countries are people willing to give up their personal wealth for the greater societal good, if it's that case, for free well, everything that you just listed that was free, you know, whether it's health care, that's education, that's whatever. I mean, do we see, is there a balance there? Is there a certain point that we end up like Venezuela and the Germans or the French go, ah, I'm done, I'm done with that, let's, let's bail out, or does it just continue to perpetuate itself forward? I think um, once a country reaches a pretty good economic point, you start to think like, Oh, we can we can help more people. We can we can do this. This is possible. Um, but in reality, that's not always going to work. Um, yeah, like uh, I forget how the saying goes. It's like hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. And that like I'm not saying that anyone who believes in any of this is weak, but. Um, I think it does. Obviously, the time that you're born into, your country's economic state has a big role to play in how you view the police. I like your quote, um, we can help more people. So as you kind of get rolling in this socialism society, or a modified socialist society, you go, well, we can, we can continue to help people. We can help those people. We can help those people. Um, at some point, I think uh, a country would probably get to the point where it can't help more people. I've got a brother who lives in Sweden right now. He's enjoying a lot of the economic benefits that are there, the free stuff, the free health care, the free education, the free all those sorts of things. But he's certainly seen some of the rough edges to that as well and the societal impact. Have we seen any other countries? We talked about Venezuela, so I'll set that to the side. Have we seen any other countries right now who go, you know what, we just can't help any more people, whether that's our own people or maybe people who are introducing themselves to our country recently? Where have we seen that play out? Because our system is now strained because of this influence. I love your softball time. Okay. Um, I don't know about that specific example. I'm not completely sure. Yeah. And this one was like our top example. So. Yeah, it's it's certainly it's a good one, yes. Denmark in the 70s could potentially be seen as that. Awesome. Denmark was, uh, it was high taxation in the same way as they are now, even higher than their 50%. Um, and so the government said we can keep we can keep funding, we can keep funding, and eventually it got to the point where people were angry that they were being taxed for so high. So they went and said we're we're just going to cut taxes. So in order to get the economic stimulation that now allows for them to pay this 50% tax, they lower taxes to the point where we would think that even that was too low. And so stuff like that, where their taxes their taxes had to become low because they were so high and it ended up failing that they couldn't pay, couldn't pay, couldn't pay. So now it's gotten into this cycle. So let me take a half step back, and I apologize. I probably stretched you a little too far. Um, if I move to one of these countries right now, do I automatically get free health care, free education, free ice cream, free whatever it is they're giving away? Do I automatically qualify for those things? No. No, why not? 
Uh, because you have to be a citizen for a certain pre-distributed or uh, pre-determined pre mm -hmm. uh, amount of time before you can do that. Otherwise, I can go to a country, get my free college, and come back here to, to the U.S. with very little detriment. So what happens if that happens? Like what if a large quantity of people, we'll say refugees, maybe, show up in one of those countries, and they immediately need, they have health care needs. You can't tell them, wait a year, and then we'll treat that medical issue. Uh, wait a year, and we'll educate your very small children to grow with you. What happens in those situations when you have a large quantity of people that are now introduced into that country, whether it's by their own making, if they immigrated themselves, or the country said, hey, come on in, we'll accept you, and we'll take care of you and do whatever. What happens to that finely tuned or sometimes precarious economic balance in those countries where, as, as Mr. Sisk said, you run out of other people's money? People get mad. Yep. And businesses shut down, mm -hmm. and then jobs are lost. Um, a lot of hospitals in like Southern California, kind of the places along the border where as an illegal immigrant, you are still entitled to uh, emergency room care. They can't turn you down. When you keep just giving them care without any kind of funding, like the money runs out and you are forced to shut down. You can't, it's just, in some cases it's just not possible. For that system class. <clears throat> so I, I'd like to shift gears just a little bit here. Um, do you guys believe that there are inherently moral implications to socialism versus capitalism? Yeah. Yes. Would you share what your thoughts are? Um, okay. So. You sure. So. Uh, so one of the big things with capitalism is it's a voluntary action. So uh, so there's not going to be any coercion. So in order for me to trade with you, Mr. Sis, you would have to then uh, be giving me something in return. And we'd have to both agree that this is something good. Otherwise, it, the trade isn't going to go through. So therefore, I don't have to coerce you. Whereas in socialism, it can end up being produce or die is in, in a very extreme sense. Um, the other thing is that as I serve, I'll be rewarded for my positive work. So therefore, that means that whatever I do has a fruit of my labor, whereas in socialism, whatever I do could end up being a slight bit fruit of my labor and a lot of it fruit of Gabe's labor too. And so therefore, what I'm producing then has to slowly trickle out to other people. And uh, the other thing is that ambition drives people to create. So therefore, instead of me being forced to create, so there's, uh, we can notice like in, in the Soviet Union, we noticed that as we made strides in the automobile industry, the Soviets were stuck in, you know, in the past. They were having these exorbitantly high prices for cars that, while over here in America, they would have been the lowest of the low, the junkers. But because no one was driven to create, to innovate, to create more, more better solutions for the problems that we have, it ended up just being that, that they were forced to work. And therefore, they never wanted to get better. Whereas in the capitalist economy, in order to stay with my competitors, I have to then be making more or better. I have to be making a product that people want to buy. And so I am driven through ambition. Yeah. And like you said, capitalism is just completely full of natural incentives to force people to create better things for lower prices. And then Milton Friedman, he people used to ask him a lot of questions like this. Um, and when it comes to the responsibility to the poor, there is socialism and there's capitalism. Socialism would say that, that it's up to the government to provide for these people, and, it, and it's forced upon the people to pay taxes and then distribute that to them. But he says, in a capitalist society, it is up to the individual to take care of these people. Take it one step further, what about the spiritual, not just the moral implications, you know, what does the Word of God say about this and how we should do it? So biblically, we don't ever hear Jesus say socialism rocks or capitalism <laughs> rocks. We never get that explicitly. But what we do get is Jesus says, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, which we can say. I mean, you can't just not pay your, pa pay your taxes because they're too high. It means that you have a legal uh, legal obligation to give to your, uh, to your government, but also a spiritual obligation, a moral obligation to your taxes, along with follow your government. So, 
Uh, so in that sense, we can say that Jesus never really took a stand, because in both senses, we really do have taxes in both. We have a government that we have to follow. It's just that one is less impactful than the other. Um, but we also see that capitalism is built on integrity and truth and honesty. I'm never going to be able to trade something unless I'm honest. And if I'm not honest about it, the, the market will, will punish me for it. And so therefore, since you know that the Bible is built on truths such as honesty, integrity, and morality, we can assume that capitalism would potentially be the better call when it comes to being a Christian economic system because it allows for people to be honest and moral and true rather than forcing each other to, to provide and therefore creating this hostile environment rather than just the one of truth, honesty, and morality. Yeah, and that's a common misconception of capitalism is people say, like, oh, it's just driven by profits and they ignore all morality, they ignore, like, environment and stuff like that. But, like Camden was saying, you have to provide for the consumer. If you are not making something or doing something for the consumer that they want and are willing to pay for, you are not going to make money. You just won't. So, the consumer has to serve, or the producer has to serve the consumer before they can make their profits. They are driven by profits, but that's also what drives them to innovate and create things that are better for lower prices. And it, it just results in a better economy, a better just country to live in. Acts uh, 2, 4, uh, Acts 2, uh, verse 45, says they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Does that sound capitalistic or socialistic? That sounds socialistic, but you also have to, oh yeah, it yeah. sounds socialistic that I would be giving up what I have to give to someone else. Yes. Um, but that's, once again, a spiritual obligation, and we also have to understand that uh, the Lord will provide. And so, in a sense, while uh, we can see that if I give away everything I have right now, and I give it to the poor, that I can then assume that the Lord will provide for me. And in some senses, people would say, the Lord will provide like manna from heaven, and other people would say that the capitalistic economy means that as I work, I can then be provided for as if it was from the Lord. Who's the they? Yeah. Who was the innocent? Who's the they? Who's they the, are the, the church. The church. Yes. Not the government. Right. Not yeah. the government. Which is the big distinction between the two as well. Is that the different? government gives out in socialism, whereas the church can give out freely in capitalism. Isn't the motivation also peace? If I want to give it away, if I want to donate to that charity, is much different than if Gabe tells me I have to donate to, have donate to, to that charity. Yeah. Yeah. Forced donation is not a donation, right? Exactly. Right. Like by no means are we saying that as a capitalist you can't help the poor. That's not at all what we're saying. But we are saying that if it's going to be moral, it's got to be free will. It's got to be your choice. It just has to. So back to Mr. Small's point. They sold property and possessions and gave to anyone who had need. Socialist or capitalist? I would say that is capitalist because that is not a government enforcement. Do you agree with that, Gabe? Yeah. Elijah? Yes. Also talk about that. Like, your biggest thing in general is do you believe is man inherently good or is he evil or bad, you could say? Mm -hmm. From a biblical standpoint, we would easily say that man is not inherently good, so therefore, we shouldn't be trusting ourselves, and man, we should be like put him on what God's going to provide for us. So, pre Christ, God revealed Himself to us through His chosen people, right? His nation of Israel. Was that a socialist government or a capitalist? Can you repeat the question? <laughs> sure. All of this discussion has been talking about Christ and his revelation to us. But before that, God mainly chose to reveal himself to humanity through his chosen people, the holy nation of Israel. That nation, did they have a socialist form of government? Did they have a capitalist form? You would think that maybe there's some message there that God wanted to communicate to us on government and formation of government. <laughs> we we know that in the in the pre-Christ uh, Israeli government that there was a lot of help between people. 
That meant that if Gabe was struggling, I would be helping him. And therefore, if I was struggling, Gabe would be helping me. But again, I think that goes back to Mr. Robinson's point, is that it's not, it was a voluntary thing. 